everybody and welcome back to the Marketing for Learning podcast. We have a really special session today because not only am I joined by Hannah Adams, my co- co- colleague, what should I call you these days, Han? My, I don't my, know. I'm just my compadre. <laughs> I just love that you still can't say Wadhams. You've only got like yeah. a few more months and I'll be a clerk, so it's all right. Thanks. <laughs> It's my, it's, my Amer- it's my American accent. That's my my blame on it. Waddams. Waddams. Waddams, yeah. And I also have another fantastic guest who you probably just heard there laughing in the form of Amanda Nolan, co-founder at Niles Nolan. Hi, Amanda. Hi, nice to be here. So the reason I wanted to get us together today is to chat about something that's kind of going on on LinkedIn at the moment. You, you must be living under a rock if you haven't seen either the post I put up, the post you put up, Amanda, or the post that Laurie also put up yesterday with regards to basically a call for arms, a little bit more transparency in our industry, um, particularly around those who are analysts, vendors who are making certain claims. There seems to be a lot of this happening in the industry. And um, I think we're all a little bit tired of it, hence why we've gone a little bit haywire on the old LinkedIn. Um, Just to give you context, if you guys haven't seen any of these posts, I will put links to them in the show notes if you want to go drink the tea. Um, But ultimately, I had a run in with an an analyst in the industry uh, a month or maybe about six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, something like that. They'd done a review of a learning platform and were speaking very positively and highly of the platform, which in and of itself wasn't problematic, but it just didn't come across as very authentic. And there was no mention of being paid to do this um, this assessment or this review. And it just all seemed a little bit suspect to me. So I commented in on, on the video and just asked plainly, you know, have you been paid to do this by X vendor? At which point both um, the analyst and the vendor kind of plainly owned owned up and said, yeah, it has been a a paid engagement. And, you know, I said, you should kind of clarify that in your post. It was all really good. There's like a really nice professional conversation about it. Everyone kind of owned the situation and there was no problems. And then about a month later, they, someone got back to me and said that they had actually deleted all the comments. And so again, it just looked like this kind of very glowing review for the specific platform from this analyst with no transparency around the fact that actually they were paid to do that when I commented again and asked them to again (laughs) reinstate the comments or you know I think I did something a little bit salty around the fact that nice to see my comments were deleted I then got blocked and and I've had some subsequent uh, impact to my own personal LinkedIn profile this happens a lot Amanda you did a similar post in really close succession to mine and I know we've talked about this in the past what what was yours about yeah, I mean, it's, you know, similar practices. And I guess I, I'm just so fed up um, with analysts. Some of them actually call themselves analysts. Other ones are pseudo analysts, but they're out there, you know, making lists and grids and, and publishing articles at times raving about solutions, which I get it. Uh, we all have to eat and it, it's a business. However, I do have a problem when these analysts who supposedly are objective are actually sitting on the cap table or taking money directly to review, review a solution and essentially, you know, plug that that solution. And then they don't disclose it, right? Mm. And so sadly, this is a practice that is really prevalent in the industry. You, I, you know, Hannah, we know this and a lot of the people that I work with closely are aware, but what really bothers me and and hence my post and and hence me sort of, you know, um, bringing the the clarion call about this is that I think maybe 80% of the buyers of HR technology really do take at face value what these people are saying in, 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 in these forums. And so I know that to be true because I work advising uh, big global 500 companies on strategy and time and time again, they say, oh yeah, you know, I'm buying X solution because this person has endorsed it and I trust their opinion. And it, it just shocks me that they aren't aware of the vested interests uh, that, that go behind that. So that's kind of what I just wanted to shine some light on that. I don't know if, you know, certainly single-handedly, I can't change this, but what I do hear is a lot of people saying, I know this is happening. I know it's not right, but that just is the way it is. And there's nothing we can do about it and call me an optimist, but at least by my post, you know, your, I think it's important we have the conversation to raise awareness. So fewer people are making bad decisions um, based on kind of dubious criteria. Yeah, I, I think and that that is exactly my position as well, is that, you know, we're we're all quite a community based folk in L and D and we really are quite trusting and it's 
it's kind of a an abuse of that authority some that is very well established and others that's somewhat self-proclaimed but nevertheless uh, you know I can think off off the bat of at least five analysts that don't really have the credentials to support that but people still listen to what they've got to say and as you've already said there in many cases is either kickbacks from vendors or they're actually on a board and therefore reaping the benefits of any profits that are accrued. So it, you know, it, it's, it's not as straight and simple as because someone, you know, I, I know like whenever you do a post about something that you like, you always say, you know, we're tech agnostic. We're not actually advocating, you know, no one ever pays us to say anything. If we say we like something it's because we like it and we think it's great. Absolutely. And I think, and as I always say, I'm not a Marxist, I'm not a hippie. And, you know, I do get paid to speak at conferences that vendors are sponsoring. I do get paid some times to help them with their strategy. And where I draw that line is, okay, I do that, but then it doesn't mean that I'm going to plug your solution. And it certainly doesn't mean that I'm going to recommend a specific tool because we have this relationship. I'm always going to do what's best for my client. And if mm -hmm. I am seeing the praises of some solution, it's because I genuinely like it. And even so I try to just like disclaim, disclaim, disclaim. And so you'll see on my post, it's, well, I'm an advice, I'm, I'm a board observer of this company or, you know, whatever the relationship may be, because I think that's important for whoever's reading that to take into account my relationship and then they, they can come to their own conclusions. Am I objective or not? Right. But at least I put it out there that, that there is a relationship. And that's what I would hope to see more of from the industry leaders. And from yeah. a straight marketing point of view, that makes you more trustworthy. That makes your voice something that people can go, oh, okay, she's being really honest here. She has got a relationship. So I, like you just said, I can make my own judgment on that. Long-term, these analysts that are self-proclaimed and making their, like getting paid to make their sponsorships and stuff and not disclaiming it, they're making a rod for their own back if we look at it from a marketing point of view because they will get found out eventually. Might be a I certainly game. hope so, I Hannah, that out. I will have a beach house one day. I mean, <laughs> that's really far off. Um, I'm honest to a fault. I think, you know, Laurie Niles Hoffman, my co-founder, and I are, are kind of known for that. I'm, I'm proud of that. I sleep well at night, and I'm trying to really do what's best for the world because at the end of the day, it, you know, it's the difference between the workforce staying relevant or not, or becoming yeah. redundant. And I think about that. It keeps me up at night. I really care about what I do. Of course, I have to run a business as well. But it's when I think of these analysts or so-called so -called analysts telling these solutions that are probably not the best ones, and then millions of people on the other end of a, of a screen, when you think about learning technology, for example, they're impacted by these decisions. Mm -hmm. And it really, really bothers me. It gets my yeah. goat. And so that's why we're here today. That's why. And, and I have to say, I, I really thought hard about, you know, should I do this post? Should I be talking about this? And the reason is I don't want um, to be to have a reputation of, of being a troublemaker. And as a woman, let's face it, it's just being a bitch. Yep. because we're, you know, calling this out. Um, and so I just really hope that that's not the case. Thank you, Hannah. I hope from a marketing perspective, it's a, it's, it's, you know, it, it reflects positively and not, and not the reverse. We've both got big social profiles as well. And, you know, I am denied about it. Hence why only really when LinkedIn got back to me and said, I don't know if there's anything we can do about reinstating your follow button. I was like, well, hold the phone. Like this is impacting yeah. Uh, you know, a presence that I've spent a lot of energy building up and it, it, it impacts my bit. I mean, it hasn't physically impacted our business, but it has the potential to because it's mm -hmm. one of the primary sources where we generate business from is LinkedIn. And so, you know, I, for me, it was like, well, hold on, because I've asked you to do the right thing. You're impact. You're potentially impacting yeah. my livelihood. Like that is really problematic. I'm not sure where the integrity is there. And for me, I have no issue with the pay pay for play stuff if it's transparent. People make a living out of being influencers. Exactly. There's no, you know, there's no shame in saying, like I said on my post, oh, X vendor asked me to take a look at this. I asked them to pay me for my time. I loved yeah. it. Well, I, I don't. Asking. What's what's the problem? You know. So I I just don't get right. why why do we feel as an industry that we have to hide it why do we feel that actually we can't call people out because it will reflect badly on us as professionals you know why do we well, have to your sit point and think, it can oh. affect your bottom line you were impacted in this case and I'm really sorry that happened to you um yeah. and, and people worry people are scared and so I think 
the vendor, you know, on, on the supplier side, no one wants to speak up, especially to call out the, the more influential names in the business, right? Because they really genuinely are, are worried that it's going to affect their business. Um, mm -hmm. What I'd like to see is more of the buyers, the, sav the savvy buyers, and some of them did, can, you know, really... Um, step up and and comment on the post that I made. I'd like to see more of them call it out because I think they have more of an influence and they're not in such a vulnerable position. Uh, unfortunately, there aren't too many of them. No. And again, because they're they're also potentially um, duty bound or wrangled by their own organizational policies exactly. and procedures, or they're also wary of speaking up and, and that getting back to the business that employs them. It's a bit of a messy place. And, and I guess you know, something that Hannah flagged to me that I wasn't even aware of because I was like, well, why does why are ads a mandatory thing like they are on Instagram? Mm -hmm. Han, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not an optional it's thing, right? Not an Instagram thing either. So no. in the UK, we have a thing called the Advertising Standards Authority um, and they regulate everything. So any billboard adverts, online adverts, adverts on the side of the bus, everything they regulate it so if there's something that's misleading in mm -hmm. that I remember that serial advert they investigated that at one point you know they were using names of celebrities and yeah yeah they yeah, investigate stuff and not everyone gets sanctioned but they have been known to sanction huge organizations for misleading adverts they also regulate the influencer market in the UK so we say people make a living out of being an influencer we all see the hashtag ad when they're putting stuff out that applies to LinkedIn. It is platform agnostic. It applies to our industry as much as it applies to any other. I think because our industry is so global, it's a it's problematic because where are people based? Where are companies based? And things like that. But actually, it's not a complicated process. And really, I, I downloaded the 20 page PDF on how to follow <laughs> their rules as an influencer. And it boils down to just be ethical about it. So there's two points that I thought were quite interesting for our industry. And the first is what is an influencer? Because I think if we said to any of these analysts, or if I said to either of you two, you're an influencer, you would say, no, I'm not. You vote, like Ash has just completely turned her nose up as that. <laughs> you, you don't like that phrase, but in fact- My teenagers might like that, but I definitely- <laughs> I think that's the problem. We think of influencer, we think of Instagram, like, hey guys, that's not what an influencer is. It's somebody that's got a following that is sharing an opinion on something. And I I know I mentioned this, this to you both before. The ASA's description of an influencer actually made me laugh out loud when I read it. Because it says an influencer includes any human, animal, or virtually produced persona that is active on any social media platform. They may be named differently on certain platforms or in reg... reg regulatory frameworks for example bloggers streamers celebrities content creators and I think in our industry we can add analyst to that so mm -hmm. it's really clear you can't hide behind I'm not an influencer um, if they're saying an animal could be an influencer and it can have all these other names so when people are spouting I've done this and um, this is a fantastic platform and things like that without saying I've been paid to do this they're actually, especially if they're in the UK, and I have seen a few comments that there are similar worldwide. I haven't had a chance to look up what they are. You are treading a really fine line of actually getting sanctioned, getting fined. Uh, they have lists on websites of people that have been fined as well. So like your name gets added to like a blacklist and stuff like that. It's, it's not just unethical. You're actually running a risk of getting in a lot of trouble. Hmm. And and just to add to that as well, um, someone commented on Laurie's post yesterday um, that there is actually policies in place in so LinkedIn has its own policy as well as to supplement mm. the ASA stuff. Um, just to quote a little bit of it, if you share content in an exchange for value, including monetary payment, endorsements, free products or services or other benefit, so it isn't just a case of money either. You must, I mean, I guess we can't get people to do reviews for pineapple swag anymore either, you know. <laughs> yeah, mate, that's our elaborate plan lost. You must label the post as a hashtag brand partnership, 
and comply with the advertising policies and applicable local laws. So they're basically bringing an ASA into that. By that, your sponsorship or brand partnership should be clear, conspicuous, and transparent. Yeah, there's no ambiguity there. It's very, very clear. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it needs to be very prominent and obvious. And the ASA actually make it really abundant, abundantly clear. They say it has to be clear to the consumer. Mm-hmm. So to those buyers that we're saying aren't questioning stuff, it has to be clear to them. So on the ASA, they've actually listed things that they don't recommend you say in. So they say like sponsored or spawn isn't clear enough. Uh, thanks to whatever brand for making this possible. That's not clear that you've been paid, um, supported by, funded by. Uh, affiliate even though if you're in marketing we know what affiliate means it's not widely known Mm -hmm. therefore they say that's not good enough they want people to say ad advert advertisement that kind of thing to make it really clear to everybody I've been paid to write this that's super interesting I guess then the question is you know to what extent is this going to be enforced and so Mm. um I can imagine LinkedIn I I was unaware until I saw that comment on on Lori's post as well that they had uh introduced this new policy I think that's great probably did they did it as a kickback exercise I'm assuming to comply with legislation in the UK and other countries and so you know what's going to stop these people from continuing to do what they do um that remains to be seen, but at least it's, again, it's a step in the right direction. I I just really think the main thing is raising awareness among the buyers that please just, you know, be careful, follow the money. Who are these analysts? What are the kickbacks they're getting? Are they, oh, are they keynoting something conference probably for six figures? Are they maybe sitting on the cap table and getting shares in a startup that they're backing? If, especially as you said, Ashley, if it just seems like the, the the review is too raving, you know, ask yourself the question, why are they doing that? Yeah, and I think that that's the bit that I think we don't see enough is that professional curiosity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Asking those questions, using your nose, um, you know, following your gut instinct. And, you know, a, a friend of ours has uh, worked in-house and has managed to get their procurement team to start to look at actually adding some questions that align to this around, you know, where, where are your kind of associations? What analysts have you paid? That sort of thing. So again, this isn't impossible, but it has to be kind of built in in a different way and baked into the procurement process, but also earlier on, even then, you know, I think, you know, obviously Han and I are marketers and marketers have a great way of spinning things and spieling and we can sell anything if we're good, but that doesn't mean we need to lie or tell mistruths. And I think the the worry for me that I see is sometimes in our industry, the people with the best marketing get the biggest traction mm. or the loudest marketing, maybe not even the best marketing. I was about to say um, the biggest people... budget. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say biggest <laughs> budget as well. And again, I know that I'm I'm now kind of overlapping the ad thing and you know the influencer market with marketing, but this all kind of sits together in terms of it's up to us as a buyer to ask the right questions to get the right answers. If we just take everything we see at face value, um, whether that be, you know, our top 10 customers or X, Y, and Z, well, why? Who are those customers? Do you have any associations with them? Are they are they getting a 75% discount? And that's why they're staying year on year. Like, ask those questions, talk to them, because I think there's not enough of that done. A lot of our industry is, oh, you work with other people in our industry. You must know our industry. So we'll work, you know, I see that a lot. Mm. Let's dig into that a little bit more. I know procurement is cumbersome at the best of times, but in order to ensure that you're actually getting the product that's promised you, you need to take the time to actually ask these more difficult questions and be prepared to have difficult discussions with people that are selling products to you because their ultimate goal is to sell it to you. <laughs> yeah, and you these know. are often multi-million, multi-year deals. And I see this all the time with the RFP process. I think um, the a lot of the buyers have a long list of tick boxes of features that they want in a product, mm-hmm. right? And then they take that out to market and who can tick the boxes, right? But they are not equally spending time really trying to vet what kind of partner that you're getting in bed with. So how is this vendor has this you know tech company do they deliver on the promises of their product 
uh, or is it smoke and mirrors? How well, you know, from an ethics perspective, how how well do they really treat their customers and their employees, right? Or is it a totally toxic workplace? Because you might say, well, mm, you know, it doesn't really matter as long as I get the product, it, it does what it says on the box. But in the end, it always does because the service that you're going to receive is, uh, it's, it's, it's connected, right? So I, I'd like to also see buyers, to your point, Ashley, ask some deeper questions as part of the standard process every time they go out to market to buy a solution they should be looking at that as well i think the question yeah. is well where did they go for advice and i know it's really hard and um it, i have a lot of respect and a lot of time for red thread research um mm. because they're completely agnostic uh unbiased operation research-based uh totally objective and you know they've said to me listen it's it's tempting we've been offered money all the time and it's hard to keep our business going because they're subscription based they rely on people paying for their research for their unbiased research and the fact of the matter is a lot of times people don't want to pay yeah yeah um, you, so you you weren't paid to mention them were you <laughs> I, I was not i was not i have absolutely no relationship other than I'm being other facetious. Fans. Big fan, big fan. Um, yeah, I, 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 like that that they're trying to do it, but it's it's it can be hard to compete because again, they're they're not taking those kickbacks, and so in their case, actually, one of the the ways that they've managed to make it work is vendors can sponsor. I think they call it a collective or something like that, but they have no say whatsoever and no sway when it comes to the research and the you know the output. So. There are there are exceptions to the rule, but by far and large, many of the analysts out there are just they are biased. Yeah, and that that is essentially the issue is there isn't really anywhere to turn. You know, I, I think Danny and the team at Red Thread are also great. Um, but again, it, it it because that data is not always accessible. That that again makes it more difficult for that transparency to be more visible too. And so. I, you know the business model is is absolutely theirs that makes sense but again that makes it difficult for the kind of wider community to to actually understand what the heck is happening so you know i it, it is it is not something that we necessarily have an answer to in terms of how we fix this but i think i i think we're all in agreement that it needs to start with those that are buying the products considering the products and solutions it isn't just learning platforms by any stretch of the imagination but we do need to actually just be more discerning, just ask mm -hmm. that, you know, where is well, that coming from? And I would what add is to that? that? I would add to that that anyone who does have any degree of influence, and no, I don't think I'm an influencer, Hannah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, anyone who has any, any sort of weight in the industry, any following, I think there's a responsibility just to call this out. And if it's not one person, it's not two people, it's, you know, many people saying this, this is not okay. Um, maybe that will lead to better decisions on the buyer side as well. And just playing devil's advocate as well, um, because the vendor actually reached out to me and kind of spoke on behalf of the analyst a little bit and kind of said that they felt a little bit attacked because I think mm -hmm. maybe you also commented on on it. Um, and I thought that was quite a difficult thing because I thought, you know, I wasn't I wasn't rude. I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't derogatory. I didn't swear. I, you know, I simply was stern and said, have you been paid for this? If so, you need to be clear about that. You know, at what point does this become like cyberbullying and anyone who does right. this, we capitalize on all their posts and start telling them, you know, I, I, is it up to, it's not really up to us oh, to police it, but how, no. how can LinkedIn and their, the ASA's tentacles can only go so far to enforce this stuff. So where's where where's the gap being gonna be plugged really yeah. well you know it's, it was in, in that particular case Ashley and I remember that I, I think this you know analyst it was the situation where they were paid money to review a platform yeah mm -hmm. and then they reviewed the platform and they said it's great right and all you were calling out is did you receive money to do to do the review yeah. And what really struck me in this case is that individual, I think they genuinely felt like they were above board, that that was totally fine. They did not see the ethical issue mm. there. You know, that that's kind of a bigger question, right? So if, if there are people out there doing this kind of thing and they actually think it's just fine, um, 
well this is goes back to that influencer definition doesn't it and mm-hmm. and um you know I think also though clear. with the Go NSA ahead. rules um it's not just the influencer the brand is just as responsible it's very That's clear true. in their guidelines so that organization might be oh well it's not it's not us it's the influencer you've paid the influencer therefore you are just as responsible mm. or analyst if we don't want to call them an influencer <laughs> <laughs> A person of influence. I think that that feels like better, more palatable Under the influence than influence. Or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's motherhood, isn't it? Really? <laughs> yeah, it, it's wine. it's a tricky problem. Uh, you know, I, I again, I, I think it's a good place to start. Just that we're talking about this, and to get more people talking about this. You're the marketers, ladies. So get the, get the word out. That's we're doing a podcast, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I know I'm conscious this is just genuinely spitballing, but you know, is there a community of practice that could be set up or I just, I don't know, but again, someone still has to run these things. Mm-hmm. Someone still has to dedicate their time to do these things. And they, they just and we, fall by the wayside if no one owns these. I, these I ideas. think it's, that's a hard one. Um, you know, in my, in my experience, you set up these working groups and everyone has great intentions and it's sort of death by consensus and nobody yeah. owns it. And it just never, because we all have, um, you know, our, our, our day jobs and our personal lives. And it's just hard to carve out time. And, and if nobody really is empowered to lead it, um, I, I don't, I don't know if that's the answer. Mm. I, I don't, I don't have the answer. And again, it's one of those contentious topics that nobody, like everyone, like you both said, people have messaged. Um, I think it was in Laurie's post as well, wasn't it? That people have messaged her saying like, Oh, like well done for that post. But outwardly people oh I've received dozens and and like we all you know know who we're referring to and what we're talking about but nobody wants to speak up exactly yeah yeah whereas actually like why are you know our council culture spreads far and wide these days I'm I'm surprised that um it's not kind of at least people are are not even showing with their feet that, that they don't kind of have the confidence in certain um big influencers opinions anymore I don't know interestingly as well I had a few people speculate the the gender of the person Mm, which I thought was particularly strange because I was like you know uh, I don't (laughs) I'm not sure what it has to do with anything but you know Amanda you said earlier what you worry about speaking up as women and and you know does that have an impact on on how we're perceived but I you know I just I thought, what's the, <laughs> what's the relevancy of their, of their gender? I, I perhaps think of just more trying to get the tea and see who it was. Um, oh, but I, nevertheless. No doubt. Yeah. And but, again, yeah. as we've said throughout this podcast, it's not necessarily about either of the cases that either of you wrote posts about. It's about the wider industry and the fact that people are just believing these analysts or the marketing and not actually investigate enough. And like Amanda touched on, we're not just talking about somebody spending millions of pounds on a platform. All those people, we, we work in an industry where it's actually going to impact the person that's utilizing the, the learning, is utilizing the HR platform. These are people's livelihoods, these their careers. There is a bigger impact of what we're doing here. It's not just somebody sold a shady bit of makeup on Instagram. This is a big problem within our industry. And it needs to be spoken about. We're not necessarily talking about that analyst or that platform. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think further to that, it actually isn't a reflection of the quality or integrity of either person's services or solutions mm-hmm. or products. You know, just because you you want to engage with someone who has a bigger reach than you and part of your marketing strategy is to leverage user generated content and social proof. Fine. That whole strategy is valid, makes sense and has a lot of legitimacy. Um where the issue is, is just not being clear. That has a bigger impact on your brand integrity. It has a really detrimental impact on the trust that people, that you've probably spent a really long time building up with people. So I guess the, you know, the lack of transparency is, it's a problematic thing because if people don't know, then it doesn't impact your brand at all. And you can just kind of be safe and happy and everyone thinks everything's hunky dory. But if people start to get a sniff of it, as you said at the beginning, Han, it actually just has a really negative effect and leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. You know, a few people commented on my post, learning leaders, in-house folk. I remember that post and I was really grateful you asked that question. I'm really sad to see it it, it got deleted, you know, and I think that's that's the vocal stuff that we want to see. Yeah. And, and, you know, people be people willing to even just say that, you know, they didn't 
they didn't go any further than that. They didn't name or shame anybody. It was just frank, you know, very clear. Nobody wants to throw on anybody under the bus or affect people's livelihoods here. But it is, you know, it, it's time for us to stop trying to do all this kind of snake oil type marketing and rise above it and do better for the industry, really. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, there's nothing that makes me prouder is when people reach out as they have in the past few days and say, listen, you know, I see you as a beacon of integrity. And not only can do I feel that I can trust you, but I know you're always going to be balanced and fair and graceful. And it's not about shaming anyone. It's not about just being a troublemaker. It's like, literally, I care about this for the reasons that Hannah, that you were describing. It's, you know, we are responsible to an extent, to, to keep the workforce upskilled, reskilled at scale and pace. That's what I wake up in the morning with that purpose and I go to bed with that purpose. And so it really gets me deeply that this kind of behavior is tolerated. So uh, yeah. thanks you know, for, for kicking off this conversation today. And hopefully this will be one little more um, you know, step in the right direction. Yeah, I hope so. I, I was thinking, obviously, we're going to, because we have, we could have, could potentially just go around in, in circles here, and I don't want us to do that. Um, so we're, we'll close off in a little bit. But Amanda, if you were to give our listeners one piece of advice in terms of how to start, maybe starting with themselves, starting with their organization, and maybe that will have that snowball effect mm -hmm. to start to positively impact the industry, what, what advice would you impart? I think is if, if you're in the market for technology, which is what we're talking about here, I think the first piece of advice that I would give is make sure you ask around, but not necessarily the companies that the vendor is putting you in contact with as a current client, but maybe ones that have actually offboarded that technology or you know that are not being recommended. And so to really get, you know, reach out on LinkedIn. Your colleagues are going to say yes. They're going to take the call and say, "Can you tell me what's the real story? You know, what is your experience as a customer working with this organization?" Equally, um, Glassware isn't always the most reliable source because that can kind of be gamed, as you, as I'm sure you know. But to go mm -hmm. on there and see, are there any just really nasty reviews from clients, or sorry, from employees that are calling out a toxic workplace and and you know unethical practices? So like, do your due diligence um, around that. Ask your peers. Ask other clients of the of the vendor in question. Um, and you know what? You still should read a lot of the reports put out there by analysts. Just be sure that you know what vested interests are going into that so that you can make sure that you, you know, you, you're reading it intelligently. Yeah. Thank you. And do you have any kind of bits of advice or anything that you think, particularly from a marketing perspective? I think it's very similar to what Amanda just said. I think having your wits about you when you're looking at stuff like we both giggled and said those are the biggest marketing budgets have a look at the ones that perhaps have the biggest stands at the expo or all of the adverts that are going around and make sure you're not falling into that trap of just going oh look they they they've spent a lot of money so they must be great and then do all that due diligence that Amanda just said but mm. have your wits about you like kind of do a recce of their marketing and say okay what are they doing? What do they stand for? Uh, because we do work in an industry, unfortunately, where marketing just shouts at each other. So if mm -hmm. one vendor does something, we've already made the joke about learning tech, haven't we, Ash, that we can predict what's going to happen at learning tech next year based on what happened this year. Everyone's just trying to one-up each other all the time. Yeah. So make sure you have that awareness of this industry. Um, it's tricky. We're spending a lot of money. You've got to prove ROI. And we're also serving a huge population of people to have your wits about you, I think is my advice. Yeah, I, just yeah. to add to that, you know, I, I do quite a bit of work on the investor side. And so what I'm seeing is there's a lot of really stupid money that's drying up a little in the past year and year and a half since the market kind of went haywire. But there's a lot of money from both VC and PE that's being funneled into this industry. And a lot of the times the investors have no, they have no idea about yeah how learning happens, they don't know the market, you know, and just because some vendor has the biggest stand to your point and the best swag, no shame in grabbing it, by the way, but right, just because <laughs> they, they have the biggest bang and the biggest budget, it does not mean that there's substance behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, often, and, I, and I, I think the buyers are often, um, you know, they're blinded by that. Oh, well, you know, they have all this money, they you know, are, are 
definitely they must be smashing it. So therefore it must be a good product. Well, not necessarily. I, I've been saying this for a while, but take the high ground, but don't be afraid to say we do not pay for endorsements. We do not pay analysts to be celebrating us, right? Um, I think if you have, I mean, maybe, maybe I'm very uh, idealistic. I'll join you there, Amanda. I think if you have a good product, you're good to your customers and you do the right thing, stuff follows, you know, you have to have a good business model and things like that. Yeah. But, you know, to me, though, if those basics are in place, then what you'll often find is these, these organizations are huge, you know, they're not profitable. They're inflated by money that's coming outside from external investment, whatever, in whatever guise that comes. And so actually the businesses are failing. They just have an end, seemingly endless supply of money. Go on company's house and go and look at how these businesses are yeah. performing because, you know, they may say to you, we haven't lost a customer in five years. That sounds great on paper, but when you unpick that a little bit, why are you still not making money then? What's going on there? Is that a good one to invest in? If What if you collapse in two years? Well, well that money dries up. What does that leave us? So, you know, I, I, I like I said, professional curiosity for me is the biggest thing of all is just ask, you know, do, do what the market is, do ask why all the time be the annoying four-year-old who asks why is the sky blue and why is this like this why is that like that you know I think that that we instead of just taking what is said to us at face value be that through marketing through customer success whatever it might be just ask a few more questions and be willing to be difficult you're you have the power as the buyer you have the power you're in control it's up to you to tick those boxes you know I they don't know how many times I've spoken to customers about their learning systems in, you know, in the context of what we do. And, you know, I'll hear many times, oh, it's just the limitation of the platform. Mm, our platform can't do that because they've got sucked into other aspects and have got, you know, carried away with certain features that are really exciting or whatever. Um, and, and not maybe kind of ask those more difficult questions around how the platform is sustained and how, how it's scalable, whatever. Um, so, yeah. Well, you know what, ladies, I, I, I'm aware that we're not going to conquer the world today and we're certainly not going to make drastic changes in the immediacy. But I think raising awareness of this through the platform and the voices that we do have is a great first step. And all of you listening would really just encourage you to challenge things that you see if they don't feel quite right, whatever they might be, not just in our industry, but anywhere. You know about ASA now and you know that they they don't like it when people don't declare ads. Um Amanda, thank you so much. I know you're very busy. So coming in and sharing um, your thoughts and giving us your time, really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's an important topic, I think. You're our pleasure, honestly. And Han, as always, I mean, I'll see you on Slack in about 20 minutes, but yep. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for joining. All right. <laughs> see you later. Take care, awesome. ladies. Thanks. Bye. Bye.